Hello, uh, thank you for uh, joining. As part of a DAERA and Peak Region funded project, we have prepared uh, short presentations with the main outputs from experimental trials. Research was done by the Monogastric Research Group, and most of the trials uh, took place in uh, AFB Peak Farm in Hillsborough. For the current presentation, we have uh, Dr. Samuel Ho, uh, in which he will be presenting um, the first of, of a series of three uh, uh, presentations. So please, Sam, um, you can start. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ramon. Thanks very much. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Samuel Ho, and as Ramon said, uh, I'm going to give a series of presentations on my PhD project, um, which was recently completed at AFBA Hillsborough. Now, the main focus of my studies was really to develop intervention strategies which improve the performance of low birth weight pigs. Uh, and as you can see there, the official title was Identifying, Understanding and Harnessing the Beneficial Impact of Genotype by Nutritional Interactions to Optimize the Performance of Low Birth Weight Pigs. So just to begin with a bit of general background, over the past 10 years, there has been an extreme increase of three and a half pigs uh, born alive per litter. And that has transformed the Northern Ireland pig industry, but it hasn't come without its challenges. So what we can see from this graph is that as litter size increases, average piglet birth weight decreases. So studies have shown a 330 gram reduction in average uh, litter birth weight and a significantly greater variation in terms of the weight within larger litters of over 16 pigs uh, compared to smaller litters of under 11 piglets. And more recent research has actually shown um, a 33 gram reduction in the average birth weight of piglets within the litter with each additional piglet born. And 25% of our newborn pigs now record a birth weight of 1.1 kilogram or less. So these compromised pigs are forming a significant proportion of the total population. And now why is that? It's largely due to a phenomenon known as intrauterine growth retardation or IUGR where the uterine blood flow of the sow is no longer sufficient to provide adequate nutrients to the, the high number of fetuses being harbored by the sow. And there's also only a finite amount of space within the uterus. So they're scoping the, the literature to show that the uterine capacity of the sow is actually restricting growth during gestation and reducing birth weights. And even position of the, uter of the, the fetuses within the uterus is becoming increasingly important. From this graph, what you can see is that the related effect of low birth weight is an elevated level of pre weaning mortality with significantly different rates of survival between different birth weight categories. Similar studies have also shown that pigs with a birth weight of 1.1 kilograms or less can display levels of pre weaning mortality up to 28%. Now, when we compare that with the current average in Northern Ireland, which is just over 12%, it's clear that we have a bit of a problem in terms of both the welfare and the output uh, of the farm. Low birth weight pigs also have poor lifetime growth. So they're associated with poor performance during lactation, as well as during the growing and the finishing period. And literature has estimated previously that these animals are going to require an additional 10 days to reach a slaughter weight. Uh, and there are various reasons which have been cited for this inferior performance, and it's related to both pre-weaning and post-weaning factors. So during the pre-weaning period, inferior growth performance is influenced by the body dimensions of the low birth weight animals which predisposes them to postnatal hypothermia. They have a high surface area to body weight ratio. And what that means is they struggle to maintain heat. And also they have a lower fat reserve, uh, which further complicates that. So these are the pigs which really benefit from having additional heat sources in the farming house. The lower vitality and the inferior dominance of the low birth weight pigs compared to heavier pigs means often that they are outcompeted by heavier litter mates for colostrum and for milk uptake. And even when they do get access to the teeth, they often lack the strength required to stimulate effective milk ejection. So that reduces the uptake of passive immunity and it ultimately results in the lower weaning weights, which we see with these compromised animals. Moving to the post weaning period, the slower uh, digestive development of low birth weight animals can result in a struggle to adapt to solid feeding. They have a reduced uptake and they also have a reduced capacity to utilize the nutrients that they eat. But according to literature, you can see at the bottom there, the main reason uh, for the inferior lifetime growth of these small pigs is their reduced capacity for lean growth. Uh, they have an inferior muscle fiber network, 
And literature shows that these pigs uh, have fewer total fibres as well as a poor ratio of their primary to secondary muscle fibres. And what that means in practice is that these animals will divert surplus energy into fat, uh, which is why the low birth weight animals are also associated with a fatter carcass uh, and a poorer feed efficiency. Because the, that process of fat deposition can actually require up to four times more energy than the same mass of lean deposition. So how does uh, current science uh, compare with what we see in current commercial practice? Well, current commercial practice of 14 piglets reared by a sow for a lactation period of 28 days is very rarely replicated in literature. And further to that, um, what is regarded as being a low birth weight pig by literature is actually a lot heavier than what we would be regarding as a low birth weight pigs on farms. And finally, the performance of low birth weight animals from birth through to slaughter it's not often considered in the science. Usually studies will focus on the impact of an intervention strategy on a particular uh, production period and don't actually follow that through, through to slaughter. But due to the intensive nature of farming, there's actually also a limited amount of data which um, is quantifying or monitoring the performance of low birth weight pigs compared to heavier birth weight pigs in commercial practice. It's just too time consuming to monitor these animals on an individual basis. So further work was required in this area. So the overall objectives of my PhD were really to quantify the performance of the low birth weight pigs in a commercial uh, production, i.e. find out really what we're up against here, how big the problem is and how best maybe to tackle that. And the second objective then was to use the information gained to develop targeted intervention strategies which had helped to maximise the performance of those compromised pigs. So that brings me to the first study which I'm going to talk about in this seminar, which was to determine the significance of compromised pigs on commercial farms. So as I said there, the commercial producers do appreciate the increasing significance of low birth weight animals. But the nature of current farming means that monitoring those animals and their performance on an individual basis is very complex and it's time consuming. And for that reason, there is little accurate data available to quantify the prevalence and the cost of low birth weight animals to the local industry. So the aims and the objectives uh, of this study were to quantify the performance of compromised pigs commercially, to establish any variation between farms, and then finally to quantify the level, the stage and the cause for mortality within each birth weight category. And really it was hoped that the conclusions drawn from this experiment could help with the development of intervention strategies which were tailored specifically uh, to low birth weight pigs in terms of which stage of production to target uh, and which techniques it would be best to employ. So in terms of the methodology, we went down to five commercial farms, um, a minimum of 50 low birth weight pigs all under one kilogram and 50 average birth weight pigs all approximately one and a half kilograms were identified on each farm. So in total, we ended up with 328 low birth weight pigs and 292 average birth weight pigs. These animals were all weighed individually at six different periods throughout the production cycle, and they all had any mortalities, had a death date, a weight, and a cause recorded. And post weaning mortalities were sent to veterinary services division um, for a standard post-mortem examination, just to really allow a reliable cause of death to be identified for those animals. So firstly, we'll look at the growth performance of the animals on the farm and then move on to examine the mortality. So this table is showing the growth performance of low and low average birth weight pigs at each stage of production. And there's a lot to digest in it, so if we just work through it one row at a time. Statistical analysis showed that low birth weight pigs came from litters with a higher number of piglets born alive. And that's in line with the intrauterine growth retardation theory we discussed at the start. But when we actually went in to look at the litters where the low birth weight pigs and average birth weight pigs were sourced, this was very clear. So if we look at this figure, considering all piglets which were used across all farms in the study, a greater percentage of average birth weight piglets were sourced from litters with a birth weight of 7 to 14 piglets born alive compared to low birth weight pigs. But on the other hand, there was a greater proportion of the low birth weight pigs sourced from litters from, uh, with a litter size of 15 to 22 piglets born alive compared to average birth weight pigs. So again, that all links back to the IUGR theory, where the mother can't provide adequate nutrient, nutrition to the high number of fetuses carried, and also that there might actually not be sufficient space in the uterus to physically support the maximum growth of those larger litters that we're now seeing, 
and that results in an increased number of low birth weight pigs. So back to the original table, again, as expected, low birth weight pigs were lighter throughout the trial. So there's a 1.2 kilogram difference compared to average birth weight pigs uh, at weaning, and that increased at every stage in the growing period to the point where it was over nine kilograms in difference in their weight at slaughter age. And that divergence in slaughter weight is greater than what has actually previously been reported in similar studies where differences of 7.6 kilograms or six kilograms were have, have been reported. Um, but data from this study, uh, is, as noted earlier, it represents pigs from larger litters with a greater divergence in birth weight than previous work which has been done. Um, but what it does do is it confirms that there is an increasing problem we are now seeing associated with compromised animals. The reasons for the divergence in birth weight are likely due to be a combination of factors in the small pigs which we touched on earlier, uh, such as that reduced vitality, that lower milk intake, their impaired digestive development, and also the reduced capacity for lean growth. But it's also interesting to note that animals which were fostered did not perform as well as those remaining with their birth mother. And that would be in agreement with the literature, which states that fostered animals may have a reduced colostrum uptake, they may experience disrupted nursing episodes, and they can even be rejected by the foster mother, depending on the timing in which fostering occurs. When we looked at that in a bit more detail, uh, we actually found that it was the average birth weight pigs which were negatively affected by fostering. The performance of low birth weight animals was much the same whether they were fostered or not, but average birth weight pigs did much better when they were reared by their birth mother. But it has to be said, regardless really of whether fostering negatively impacts on pigment performance or not, continual increase in litter size means that the practice of fostering is going to continue to be essential for producers going forward. Um, but further work may be needed here to determine which animals are best to foster to enhance the overall farm performance. This table shows the strength of the correlation between animal weight at various stages of production. Now, values below the diagonal report correlations between the weights of low birth weight pigs, whereas the values above the diagonal report correlations between the weights of average birth weight pigs. The correlation between birth weight and subsequent weights was stronger for the low birth weight pig population compared to average birth weight pigs, but the strength of the correlation between winning weight and subsequent weights was much the same regardless of birth weight. In essence, really what this table confirms is that light birth weight pigs uh, recorded lighter weights at each stage, with, with the opposite being true for average birth weight pigs. So if you're heavier at birth, you're more likely to be heavier uh, at each stage of production. The superior growth performance of average birth weight pigs is confirmed by their greater average daily gain at each stage of production, which is shown in this table. But it's particularly interesting to note that the greatest divergence in the average daily gain of low birth weight pigs compared to average birth weight pigs came between weeks 4 to 8 at weaning and also at weeks 8 to 12. During those two periods, we saw a difference of 77 grams per day and 85 grams per day, respectively, in the favour of the average birth weight pigs. And this shows that the negative effect of weaning uh, is more pronounced on low birth weight pigs. And it would suggest that the, the compromised pigs really struggled with that transition from milk to solid feeding in the post weaning period, and that held back their growth. There are several reasons why that could have been the case. It's likely that the underdeveloped digestive system associated with low birth weight pigs played a big part here, and that can manifest as a reduced height of the geodenum mucosa or a reduction in their enzyme secretion. But the physiological impact is a reduced digestive capacity and a reduced ability for those low birth weight pigs to utilise the nutrients that are provided in their feed. On the basis of the figures recorded from this study, if we modelled out how long it would take uh, both low birth weight and average birth weight pigs to grow to a slaughter weight of 120 kilograms. And we find that without any intervention, low birth weight pigs required an additional 11 days to reach that target market weight of 120 kilograms live weight. However, not all animals uh, fitted this model and the outliers were excluded. When we based the, the calculation on the raw data figures, which included all animals, it showed that low birth weight pigs could take an additional 18 days to reach the target market rate of 120 kilograms, so a very big difference. Again, this is a bit of a busy table, but what this is showing is how the growth of low birth weight and average birth weight pigs compared between each of the different farms, so how, how what was the variation between the five farms. In essence, when comparing all the farms, I found that low birth weight pigs were lighter than average birth weight pigs in the majority of cases. 
And further to that, when comparing the low birth weight pigs to average birth weight pigs on any given farm, the low birth weight animals were almost exclusively significantly lighter. But when also looking at the average daily gain, there were certain periods when low birth weight pigs on one farm outperformed average, per, average birth weight pigs on another farm. So there were significant differences between farms. So an example of that is that it meant that on farm five, low birth weight pigs uh, recorded a weaning weight similar to that of average birth weight pigs on the other four farms. Whereas if we look at week 12, low birth weight animals on farm three recorded a weight uh, similar to average birth weight pigs on other farms. Really the take home message from this is that whilst the physiology and the genetics of these animals plays a major part in their performance, growth can also be heavily influenced by the production systems employed and also how the animals are managed on the farm. So we've looked at how uh, the average weight of the population differed between farms, but now what this table shows is how the variation in the weight within the low birth weight pig populations compared between farms. And similarly, the variation in the weight of average birth weight pigs uh, between farms was also compared. The variation in the live weight of low birth weight pigs differed significantly between farms in weeks 8 and 17. So what that means is that there was less variation in the weight of the low birth weight pig population on some farms compared to others. Similarly, for average birth weight pigs, the variance uh, in the weight differed uh, at weeks 4, 17 and 22. So again, we can confirm that there was a substantial difference in the performance between farms, both in terms of the average weight of the, the different birth weight categories, but also in terms of the spread of weights within the population on each farm. Bringing the farms together again as a whole, the variation in weights of both low birth weight and average birth weight pig populations increased significantly with an increasing live weight. So for example, the weight variation within the population increased from weeks 4 to weeks 8 to week 12 and so on. But what this diagram shows is the percentage of low birth weight and average birth weight pigs in each weight category at slaughter age. And it shows that as expected, the majority of average birth weight pigs were heavier when compared to low birth weight pigs at the same slaughter age. Uh, so for example, 50% of low birth weight pigs were in the category from 85 to 100 kilograms whereas 58% of the average birth weight pigs fell between 90 and 110 kilograms. But what it also shows, which is a very interesting point, is that the spread of slaughter weights of the animals in both birth weight categories was actually quite similar. And that would be in contrast to literature, which often would conclude that it is the low birth weight animals which should be targeted to try and reduce growth variation on the farm. But what this study shows is that there's actually scope to improve the uniformity of growth within both low birth weight and average birth weight pig populations. Now moving on to look at mortality. Pre-weaning mortality of the low birth weight pigs was over three times that of average birth weight pigs. The pre-weaning deaths uh, of low birth weight pigs also occurred earlier in lactation and pigs were lighter at their time of death. So pre-weaning mortality clearly manifests differently within the different birth weight categories. Pre-weaning deaths of animals which had been fostered uh, also occurred earlier in lactation. Moving to post-weaning mortality, this, did actually, this actually didn't differ with birth weight, nor was there a significant difference in the age or the weight of the animals at death between the two birth weight categories. As post-weaning mortality were evenly spread over the post-weaning period in both birth weight categories, it was also not possible to establish a period of highest mortality risk. However, numerically, it can still be seen that the, the low birth weight pigs had a greater percentage of post weaning deaths. Uh, so either these animals were more susceptible to infection or they lacked the ability to recover when they had become infected. Another interesting point here was that the, pre, the post weaning mortality rate of average birth weight pigs was actually greater than their rate of pre weaning mortality. And that's an area of concern for producers because, in addition to reducing income through a reduced number of pigs marketed, post weaning deaths also represent wasted investment for the farmer in terms of feed costs. Statistical analysis also showed a clear association between birth weight and the cause of pre weaning death. So starvation and overlying of piglets were the major causes of pre weaning mortality in low birth weight pigs. You can see there that they accounted for 28% and 49% of all deaths respectively. So it's clear that low birth weight pigs weren't getting access to milk. That's probably a combination of their reduced vitality and also being outcompeted by heavier and stronger litter mates in these larger litters for what is a limiting local resource. That would account for both the high level of starvation as well as the earlier timing of their deaths. 
Also, as I said earlier, the, birth, the high surface area to body weight ratio of low birth weight pigs combined with their low body fat reserve increases their susceptibility to postnatal hypothermia. And this increases their likelihood of crushing due to lethargic movement of those chilled piglets. And that explains the high number of low birth weight pigs which died following overlying by the sow uh, during lactation. In contrast, 30% of pre weaning deaths for average birth weight pigs were due to an unknown cause, with a further 22% due to overlying by the sow and 13% due to scarring related uh, illness. Looking at post weaning mortality now on the right hand side, no obvious differences were identified in the causes of post weaning deaths between low birth weight and average birth weight pigs. But if we combine and look at both birth weight categories, 20% of mortalities were uh, contributed to by the alimentary tract infection, uh, and the respiratory tract was also affected on 20% of the post weaning deaths. Digestive disorders have previously been linked to the abrupt withdrawal of the milk, uh, the maternal milk in weaning. That milk supplies a variety of bioactive compounds uh, which aids digestive and immune development. And animals can also suffer negative changes to that intestinal structure and function due to insufficient feed intake post weaning and that can lead to intestinal inflammation. So those will be some of the causes of the, the alimentary tract illnesses uh, seen in this study. With regard to the respiratory disease, high animal stocking density, inadequate ventilation and failure to maintain house hygiene uh, can increase the risk of those respiratory infections. So to conclude uh, this first study, low birth weight pigs weighed almost 10 kilograms less than average birth weight pigs at, slaughter, at a slaughter age of 22 weeks. The low birth weight pigs recorded a 56 gram per day slower growth rate throughout from birth through to slaughter. The, this divergence in the performance between low birth weight and average birth weight pigs was mainly driven by that poor average daily gain of the low birth weight pigs during the immediate post weaning period. The pre weaning mortality of low birth weight pigs was over three times that of average birth weight pigs, and there was a clear association between birth weight and cause of death. Half of those low birth weight deaths during lactation were due to starvation. Significant variation existed in the weight of animals at slaughter age within both the birth weight categories, and significant variation also existed between farms. But really, the take home message from this study was that intervention is required during lactation and the immediate post weaning periods to try and minimize that mortality and to maximize the weight of our low birth weight pigs. Um, so that's the end of the first seminar. I'd just like to thank uh, the Department of Agriculture for their sponsorship to carry out these studies. Uh, and as well as the help of Pig Regen of AFB, uh, the AFB farm staff uh, and Queen's University for their help and advice throughout. Thank you.